Good afternoon. On behalf of the NLN Board of Governors, the CEO, and the NLN staff, welcome to the National Faculty Meeting. I am Dr. Kathleen Poindexter, Chair-Elect for the NLN Board of Governors. In the NLN tradition, I am honored to chair this meeting. Wouldn't you agree that this has been an exciting summit, beginning with our opening speaker, Rear Admiral Susan Orsega, who is leader extraordinaire, and yesterday, we heard the CEO's address given by our illustrious CEO, Dr. Beverly Malone, who inspired us to lead strategically and think intentionally and compassionately during these challenging times. And this morning, we heard Colette Foisidal's innovative and futuristic presentation, demonstrating how faculty can teach students to learn in the realm of virtual simulation. This afternoon, I am honored to introduce another dynamic and visionary leader, Dr. Georges Benjamin. Dr. Benjamin is known as one of the nation's most influential physician leaders because he speaks passionately and eloquently about the health issues having the most impact on our nation today. From his firsthand experience as a physician, he knows what happens when preventive care is not available and when the healthy choice is not the easy choice. As Executive Director of the American Public Health Association, or APHA, since 2002, he is leading the association's push to make America the healthiest nation in one generation. He came to APHA from his position as Secretary of the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Dr. Benjamin became Secretary of Health in Maryland in April 1999, following four years as its Deputy Secretary for Public Health Services. As secretary, Dr. Benjamin oversaw the expansion and improvement of the state's Medicaid program. Dr. Benjamin is a graduate of the Illinois Institute of Technology and the University of Illinois Chicago of Medicine. He is a member of the National Academy of Medicine, formerly the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. In April 2016, President Obama appointed Dr. Benjamin to the National Infrastructure Advisory Council, a council that advises the president on how best to assure the security of the nation's critical infrastructure. Dr. Benjamin will now speak on the topic, COVID-19, a public health challenge. Let's welcome Dr. Benjamin. Kathleen, thank you very, very much. And, and everyone, I'm, I'm glad I could be here today. We're going to obviously talk about this novel coronavirus. I think everybody in the world has seen this, this picture of this uh, little round virus with the spiky things. Um, the tragedy is that we do have a true pandemic, and it's a real problem here in our country. We have over um, almost 7 million cases. Um, we're averaging somewhere around 40,000 cases a day um, and over 200,000 deaths, um, somewhere around you know, 800, 700, 800 deaths a day. And it's, it's really a problem um, that we really haven't gotten our hands around this, uh, this epidemic yet. I'd like to talk about the fact there are really three epidemics. Um, the infectious disease one that we, we're always talking about, an infodemic, which is a term that was coined by the World Health Organization, which is really about lots of misinformation and disinformation, uh, a profound epidemic of fear, um, fear of the unknown, in fact, we're in a rapidly communication environment, uh, which includes these um, misstatements and lots of really, really poor risk communication by a variety of actors, um, certainly, frankly, mismanagement by some policymakers, um, fear of persecution, and ultimately a loss of trust for a lot of the things that we're doing um, has, has really um, been a, a, a trademark of this outbreak so far. Um, this virus is uh, um, an RNA virus, is in a family of coronaviruses. Um, it ranges, um, the family of viruses ranges from the viruses that cause the common cold um, to MERS, which is the um, coronavirus you get from camels, which is not very infectious. Um, SARS-1, which we had several years ago, and now what we call SARS-CoV-2. Um, this um, new virus is interesting because a lot of the things and decisions that we've made have been based on what we thought we knew about the other viruses. Um, and it turns out this um, COVID-2 virus is much more infectious um, and in many ways um, has a different 
pathological um, footprint than the others. We know from an epidemiological perspective that each, one, each person can infect at least two other people, uh, recognizing there are super spreaders who can affect lots of people. Um, the way I like to think about this is more infectious than influenza. Um, and, um, and, and that's one of the real challenges here. People try to always compare it to the flu and it really is much more infectious than, than influenza. Um, it's also less infectious actually, by the way, from an infectious disease perspective than measles. Um, we know that for people who do get sick, about 80% of the cases do have mi relatively mild symptoms, um, but 20% of the folks that have severe symptoms, um, and those are the ones who end up in the hospital and often into the intensive care unit, point out that one of the, the tragedies of this disease is that even some of the people who have mild symptoms have a prolonged and persistent clinical course to recovery. The case is highly rated somewhere around between one and a half and three and a half. Um, it'll probably be lower at the end of the epidemic because once we get the real baseline, um, the actual fatality rate will be lower than what we've initially seen. Uh, and as I mentioned, this disease not only impacts the lungs, but it has a, a, a large footprint to impact very many organ systems, including the brain, the heart, the kidneys. Um, and it creates a profound immune dysfunction um, which also results in a, a range of secondary injuries. And in fact, some of the clinical response to this has been to really modulate the immune dysfunction that we're seeing in the disease. It turns out, unlike the original SARS virus that we saw several years ago, that this one has profound community transmission, even in the pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic state. And it can be anywhere from 25%, and there are some studies as much as 40% of asymptomatic transmission. We know that when people have gotten sick, it does has had a disparate impact with Native Americans, um, African Americans, Latinx, and even Asian and Pacific Islanders who all had um, a higher incidence of serious disease when compared to non-Hispanic whites. And recognizing this is a disease of exposure, primarily, we get this disease from other people. Um, the reasons are really fall into three buckets. Um, people with public facing occupations, so folks that work in nursing homes, um, healthcare providers that are, of course, being taking care of uh, patients with COVID. If you work in a meatpacking plant, if you work in a farm, particularly a chicken farm where you're out and about among other people not wearing a mask and unable to physically distance. If you're in public transportation, large percentage of folks um, are in those jobs. We have had some delayed sheltering in place um, because of people who don't believe the disease is real um, or who minimize the disease, or in many cases, because the experience of Americans, because we're a big country, has been different depending on where you live. Obviously, it hit the urban centers first. Um, the rural community, in many cases, didn't think they were at risk, and now it's ravaging our, 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 our rural communities and the Midwest. <clears throat> Acceptability. Prevalence of chronic diseases. Um, we now know that uh, people with chronic disease like heart disease, lung disease, um, uh, kidney disease, even hypertension have a higher prevalence of getting very sick when they get this disease. Uh, and then of course the social determinants that like many things determine whether or not you can get the services that you need. Um, so lack of paid sick leave, people have not uh, taken off from work because if you don't work, you don't eat. Um, Poverty, housing situations, people who in multi-generational households, um, if, as an example, or where there are multiple people living in a home where the home is relatively small and if someone gets infected, they cannot properly isolate or quarantine so everyone else in the household uh, gets infected. We know that it's transmitted by three clear routes. Um, again, a respiratory pathogen. Um, droplet spread is probably the predominant spread there is aerosolization. Um, the exact role in terms of the prevalence of disease with aerosolization is not real clear, but we do know that if uh, we've had lots of examples of people that have gone into to rooms that have been infected, um, restaurants and people downwind from those individuals have gotten um, infected um, and probably in, in the healthcare setting as well. Um, fomite, um, 
transmission, of course, does occur. That's when you contaminate your hand or, or a surface, and then someone comes behind you and touches that surface and therefore then injects themselves, inoculates themselves with the infection. Um, that's not a prevalent um, way in which people have gotten infected, um, even though I know we spend a lot of time and effort cleaning things. Turns out this, this bug is, is pretty easily deactivated by um, common cleaning methods and the fact that we've been um, self-sequestered at home and not out and about, fomite transmission is probably less. But of course, as we go back out from our homes, we're gonna probably see more of that um, mode of transmission. Prevention is clearly the key. The non-pharmacological interventions is what we have today. Uh, wearing a mask, washing your hands, physically distance, um, and selective closures of large events. The goal, of course, is to try to keep uh, people um, as far apart as we can and to try to stop large super spreader events um, like weddings and um, schools and businesses where lots of people are out and about and all kinds of um, rallies and things like that. We know that masks work. This is a neat chart that was done by the Kansas health officer that shows um, in those um, uh, counties where they have a mask mandate, that's the, um, um, the red counties, that the incidence of the disease um, goes down um, compared to those blue counties within Kansas that, um, that did not um, require people to wear masks. We've seen this in lots of jurisdictions, so this is just not, um, not seen in Kansas. Many states have now gone back and looked at these phenomena in their jurisdictions and those that have masks do better than those that don't. So we know that masks work. We know this idea of physical distancing um, and flattening the curve works. Again, the original goal there was to try to, to um, de-burden our health system to the extent we can, reduce disease and, and um, morbidity mortality, as well as give us time to scale up testing and scale up our contact tracing capacity. Um, unfortunately, we really did a poor job of scaling up both testing and contact tracing. We, we did effectively debulk most of our healthcare system, but it was a challenge. You know, and containment strategies work. Basic public health, you know, stuff we've been doing since the beginning of the, uh, of the 20th century where we um, um, identify someone with the disease, we isolate them, we do contact tracing, we isolate or quarantine the individual, um, and then we test those people that, um, that need to be tested, and that cycle repeats. Um, is the most effective way um, without therapeutics and without a vaccine to manage a disease of this type. We have gotten better at treating people. Um, general supportive care is certainly what we started with. Um, we've learned a lot about pulmonary management. We used to innovate everybody that we thought needed to be innovated because they um, were having trouble oxygenating, but we've learned a lot about how to continue to oxygenate patients um, through proning or turning them on their side, um, cranking up the oxygen, um, doing some things and not intubating people as aggressively as we did before. It turns out um, people don't do well when you intubate them. Um, so if you can avoid it, you don't. Um, we don't have a lot of antiviral agents, but we're just beginning to get a few. Redensevir is one drug that is in a randomized controlled trials and does seem to shorten the clinical course of the disease. I mentioned the immunological basis of this disease, so steroids do play, seem to play a good role in selected cases, as well as antibody-rich plasma, again, in selected cases, does seem to play a role. Um, monoclonal antibodies is one of the new experimental, experimental uses that we have. And of course, the vaccines that we have, uh, which there are many trials now, um, they are in phase three. I want to point out that none of these trials are in children in the United States. So for all practical purposes, this is an adult event um, in terms of vaccines. And we will probably not start doing clinical trials on children until we know more about the um, safety and efficacy of the vaccines that we have today. Of course, the U.S. is, is starting to try to reopen. Um, I would argue that these are the criteria for effective reopening, making sure you have a health system that can handle it, making sure that you have um, a robust testing and contact tracing infrastructure. Uh, you know you're doing enough testing if you have less than 5% positivity, um, because that tells you they're not having selected populations. And you have to have the ability to effectively isolate and quarantine, as I mentioned, um, with the housing situation. 
And there are some communities that are actually um, putting up people um, in hotels or offering them other housing options in order to be able to effectively manage their, their social needs and then providing the social supports as wraparound services for those folks. So here are certainly three places where one can go to get effective knowledge. We have had challenges getting uh, good information out, but I still think the CDC on, on whole has um, great information. The World Health Organization and there's the APHA website um, um, because we have a fair amount of good stuff there. So with that, I'll stop and we can uh, take questions. Thank you. Dr. Benjamin, thank you for your powerful and enlightening remarks. Let's all give him a round of applause from wherever you are. Okay, next, as Dr. Benjamin said, um, he's willing to take questions. So we wanna hear from you with your questions. Please take advantage of this opportunity because it's not every day that we have a national and internationally renowned speaker like Dr. Benjamin in our presence. Please put your questions into the comment box and be sure to include your name and school. Um, we'll read them off and in the order that they're entered. We'll give it our best shot here. Kathleen, uh, while we're waiting for comments, oh, here we go, here's one. I just got another one that was text, that I got in a text too. Um, the first one is from Dr. Pierpont Solden, excuse me if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. Um, the question is, do you have any suggestions on how to manage disinformation? And she's from the College of St. Scholastica, my alma mater. Yeah, the best way to, to, to address disinformation um, or misinformation, you want to differentiate the two. Misinformation is you know, the stuff we, that we honestly and, and, and innocently tell other people that turns out to be wrong. Uh, and disinformation is when someone purposely does that. Um, let me say that there are people out there that are purposely passing disinformation, um, telling communities of color that you shouldn't get tested. There's a fascinating flyer at the Homeland Security and Preparedness site in New Jersey um, which has both the CDC and World Health Organization logos on them, which says that if you get COVID, you should go to synagogues, you should go to underserved communities, you should ride the bus. Um, obviously, it's 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 a it's a piece of different disinformation, but there's lots of that kind of stuff out there. So people ought to check stuff before they share it. Um, but the best way to get rid of um, that kind of information is with good information. So. Um, dealing with things that are wrong right away. Um, and even when I say it and I make a mistake, I'm, I'm not, I'm human. Um, correcting it right away, um, telling people what you know, what you don't know, and, um, and then being persistent about it. Overwhelming the, dis the, the misinformation with the facts and then give people places where they can go where they can even verify what you say. Some good advice, thank you. Our next question is from Sheila Abib, and she asks, if and when a vaccine has been approved, is there a strategic plan for distribution? All right, so I, 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 will, I won't give you the, the, the presidential answer for that, but what I will <laughs> tell you is that, um, is that let, me just, let, me, let me deal with the issue about how fast this vaccine um, development is occurring and get rid of a couple myths. Myth number one is, well, let me just say that we've been working on coronavirus vaccines for many, many years. Remember that it is in the family of the common cold and people have been trying to figure out how to, how to do vaccines to stop common cold, right? It's, it's a huge loss of, 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 of people in the workplace. Also SARS-1, there was a lot of money poured into addressing SARS-1 and MERS. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the research money dried up, but we were well on our way to understanding some parts of the immunology of this disease. For example, we already knew that the spiky stuff, the spiky point of the virus, is what created the best immune response. So a lot of the early animal studies simply had to be redone with this new virus very quickly. 
and they were able to move that stuff along. Many of you who have been involved in research know that's the part of, I mean, the animal studies and the early studies is, is really the time um, consuming part of, of this research. So they were able to move this along um, into phase two studies very quickly. And now we're in phase three for several of the vaccines. Also, they've been doing a lot of vaccine work, looking at how they can create vaccines for a range of chronic diseases, and immunological diseases. So even though we're using new kinds of techniques and models, um, with the new stuff we have, the new science that we've learned over the years, um, we're, able to, we're able to speed this up. Most of what they're speeding up is the logistics of vaccine production and the fact that they're producing more vaccine to be used if the vaccines become effect, are shown to be safe and effective. So they're not doing it sequentially is what I'm trying to say. Now, having said that, um, we still have a lot of work to do. You can't, you can't move the science along. And I don't think that a person like me who can telework will be, start, will be eligible to get my vaccination and probably sometime this next year. It'll be, it'll be early summer next year before the general public will get this. Now, there are some logistical challenges. Remind you that, that what you may or may not know is that th several of these vaccines require very cold storage. Um, and, and those of you who've, who've practiced clinically know that, um, you know, most nurses that provide vaccinations, most physicians that provide vaccinations don't have uh, freezers in their offices that can store things at 112 degree Fahrenheit, minus 112 degrees Fahrenheit. So there, there's, a, there's an issue about distrib distribution, et cetera. Um, even though the federal government says they're gonna buy it and at least initially provide it um, um, free to every citizen. Well, thank you. You've, you've given us hope for the if and given us some realism for the when. <laughs> That's important. Our next question is from Janek McNeil. Given the lack of national efforts in testing, what is an optimum level of testing contact tracing you feel would help us reopen even before widespread vaccination? Yeah, I, I, we need to get every part of the country down to 5% to start, but you know, the, cl the closer you can get to 1% and 2%, um, if, you get, if you get to that place where you're doing that much testing um, and you have a contact tracing force of easily 100, 150,000 people who are well-trained and have the capacity to and empathy to talk to people uh, on the phone. So think about what you would do <clears throat> if somebody called you on the phone and said, hey, you were uh, exposed to someone yesterday with COVID-19 and I want to know where you were. Someone you have no idea who they are. Um, you probably wouldn't say much to them. So this is a real challenge, particularly when we don't have the ability in many communities to do the traditional knocking on the door, using community health workers, finding, finding Johnny, um, where you have to find him. You know, in the, the old HIV AIDS days and, and STD days, when we, were, we were hunting people down and we had people that knew the community and they, they knew how to find folks. Well, th that's a problem because we can't, we, we don't really have those folks um, as integrated into this response as we need to. Um, and that, and that, that organization hasn't gone well in many, many communities. Okay. Thank you. Our next question is from Kimberly French and she asks, is tachycardia a very common symptom? And if it is, what causes this response in COVID positive people who are fever free? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I had not heard that before. Um, but let me expound on that on the issue of fever. Now, you know, I'm talking to a nursing organization and you know, you know the value of fever if you have it. You also know the value of fever if you don't have it. You also know the value of, of fever if you took two Tylenol. So <laughs> fever is not a great, uh, I mean, everyone's taking everyone's temperature and we're doing it at my job too. Um, but I think it's more of a, um, um, look, in many cases, looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, but it's, you know, it's reasonable to do if it doesn't cost a lot of money. 
I wouldn't pay fifty thousand dollars for a screening machine for an, you know uh, unless it was in a you know, maybe the airport or something like that. Um, but it because all you know you know most if someone doesn't feel well even if they don't know have a, they have a fever if they haven't taken their temperature you don't feel well you take a cup of Tylenol you know you feel better you don't really know you had a temperature um, so we really do have to create a culture of people taking their, their temperature more but by the way you could be highly infectious and not have a fever at all throughout the clinical course of this disease particularly if you have mild disease so f fever is not necessarily it's, it's an important sign if you find it, but then like anything else, you have to know why they have a fever. It may have nothing to do with COVID. So true, as we're, as we're finding with all of our students back in uh, universities and colleges. Um, our next question is from Marcia DePaulo, and she asks, should it be assumed that all hospitalized patients who suffer cardiopulmonary arrest are COVID positive to prevent mm -hmm. aerosolation aerosolation risk when cardiac compressions are started? Well, that's a good question. Aerosolized. Um, and I don't, have, I don't have a clue how you're going to do that. I, I, I think you've got to resuscitate patients. And I think the solution is um, for any patient, until you know they're not COVID positive, for you to assume that and use respiratory precautions um, and, and for most patients, particularly any sick patient, for sure. Um, and that means masking um, and gloves at, at the minimum. And then obviously in high risk situations, you know, face shields, et cetera. Um, again, we don't know the prevalence of aerosolization in terms of um, how often people get sick from it. We do know that there are lots of studies, uh, well, there are several studies, I won't say lots, that have shown the presence of virus, viral particles remotely from the patient inpatient rooms. There have been a few studies that have shown that some of those viral particles are still active. Um, but as you know, activity, infectivity has a great deal to do with the dose of the virus you receive, how you receive it, um, and frankly, probably um, your own um, the bodily defenses. Um, and we just haven't studied it enough to know for sure. But aerosolization is real. Um, and in a clinical setting, even more real because those patients tend to be, of course, sicker and conceptually have higher viral loads. Thank you. Our next question is from Katherine Hendricks. Good question. Are certain tests for COVID, nasal swabs, throat swabs, rapid tests versus non-rapid tests, more effective than others? I'd say, and what's the difference? Yeah, they all have a, have a different sensitivity and specificity like every other test. Remind, remember, the first thing we, we all remember is what the test actually tests for. So those nasal swabs um, um, that are looking for whole viruses and many of the quick tests are looking for um, parts of the virus to test for. Um, so a lot of the quick tests, you know, look for any, any part of the virus and those are less sensitive than the ones that look for whole virus. And even the ones who look for whole virus, um, the test shows the virus is there, but then they have to do a secondary test to show that the virus is still active. Most of the quick tests are not done to show that the viral particles that they find are active. Um, but that coupled with a, um, a screen for symptoms, um, you know, lessens the, um, the risk of um, if they're all negative for someone having it. And what some people do is they do um, a couple different screening tests, um, particularly a couple of the quick tests as a way of um, trying to offset some of the sensitivity and specificity issues with the quick tests. But look, you know, those of you who have worked in, um, you know, in big outpatient settings where you've had to screen a lot of patients for a lot of disease, you know, you. You do that. You get the best and most accurate screening test that you that you that you have. You recognize the the sensitivity and specificity of that, and you build that into your um, your system so that you um, you will have an oops. This person was really infected, and we missed them somewhere along your clinical train chain, and you just try to reduce that risk as much as you can. Okay. Thank you. 
Diane McAdams Jones asks, in Utah, our numbers have doubled from 500 to 1,000 plus since school semester. Have you any suggestions for encouraging people to wear a mask? Oh. Mandates versus gentle reminding. And she's from Utah Valley University in Orem, Utah. Yeah, here's a challenge with, with you know, we, we, lo we lost the battle. We, we got behind the curve on this, on this issue. Most people will do what you ask them to do if you give them an intelligent reason for doing it and you don't politicize it. Um, I'm kind of in the, let's try the um, persuasion per first argument first. Um, but you can require it if you explain it to people. Um, and you and you don't make in silly requirements. Um, you know, if someone's out running and nobody else is around, even if there's a mask requirement for outdoors, why would you, you know, give someone a fine for that? That makes no sense. Don't do stupid things. Um, but if they're in a, a group of other people, then they should wear a mask. Um, and we should we should be really straight up with folks. Here's how you get the disease. I cough on you, you cough on me. If one of us is infected, then one of us, you know, then, then you'll get infected from me. And if I wear the mask, I protect you. And if you wear the mask, you protect me. And if we both wear the mask, we protect each other. And you couple that with being as physically distanced as reasonable um, in, the, in the activity that we're doing, um, washing our hands, then it's all about risk and treat it like any other clinical intervention um, and talk to people as though, you know, put your nurse ha hat on and talk to them using your nursing voice. Um, although I've had a lot of nurses that tell me what to do, but that's probably because I'm a physician <laughs> um, <laughs> when I'm screwing up. Uh, but you use your nursing voice and your clinical bedside manner from a public perspective and talk to, to these folks, they will understand in most cases. And then every now and then you're going to have someone who's terribly uncompliant. And then you have to figure out, you know, at what point do you, um, do you force, the, force, the, uh, force the issue? Thank you. And, and, and I'm glad you, add, you added that when you were messing off statement to the nurses. <laughs> we're a team. <laughs> Tracy Riley asks, what is the science now about hydroxychloroquine? And she's from Mount Carmel College Nursing. Yeah, the, the, the evidence right now is pretty clear that hydroxychloroquine um, doesn't have any role in the management of, of patients with COVID-19. They're still doing studies. And um, the real issue is, um, like anything else, there's still not a silver bullet um, for any of these diseases. Um, even Redensivir is not a silver bullet. It, it, it shortens the clinical course. Um, but hydroxychloroquine um, is um, not, not only is it not really effective, but it has enormous implications for cardiac arrhythmias in subsets of patients, particularly people with long QT syndromes um, and have any other kind of accelerated um, uh, pathway um, in their heart. Those folks are at higher risk for having um, life-threatening arrhythmias. Okay, good to clarify that. Mitzi Reed from Reed Calhoun Community College asks, is there any data to support blood type in, and if it determines an individual is more susceptible or not? Or is it yeah. infodemic? Yeah, like, you know, there is some evidence um, and uh, for the blood type issue. And I forgot what blood type uh, Put you at less risk. I think it's O, um, but 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 that's you know it's 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 kind of a more of a curiosity than anything else. Um, and I don't know that anyone has definitively said that. So first of all, no particular blood type it makes you immune. None of us are immune. We've not found any of those yet. So I think it's all relative. Um, but that's that's about this the the. The, the limit of my understanding of that. Good question from Jean Longbottom, um, Galen College of Nursing. Is there a way to recover public trust in our healthcare professional resources? Mm -hmm. Is there a way to unscare people 
looking at official initiatives like Operation Warp Speed, which gives the connection to speed before science. Yeah, well, they, they clearly the administration did not talk to a communications expert when they decided to do that, um, come up with that name. Um, and, nor, and, and let me just, let me just step back, you know, because I, I beat on them periodically, but let me just talk about the importance of planning. When you, when you have, you know, the administration was given a, a, a pandemic plan uh, initially, um, and it was a good starting point. But when this thing first became a concern, they really needed to sit down in a room and craft a comprehensive plan. What planning does, when you get all the right people in the room, is you identify the more likely things are to happen, and you do things in the short term and you do long term planning and then you adjust it over time and they didn't do that and they've not done that. And because they've not done that they keep they're chasing the, 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 the outbreak. Um, and so I think that the, the fundamental challenge and then you have all of the, the misstatements and the, the, the fact that they've clearly given the, the public the the concept and belief, and I believe this, that many of the things are being done for a range of political reasons. Um, the science that our scientists are doing is still pretty sound. In fact, it's very sound. And the vast majority of people working on this every day in the federal government are doing this um, um, correctly and um, um, using the best science that they have. It's a lot of it's the communications. And that means that we have to build trust that means that they could get up tomorrow and start doing it right, doing good risk communication. But it will take time because people come from a place that they don't trust things. And um, they need to have trusted messengers. They need to let those trusted messengers speak. They need to, they need to stop doing um, um, and think about their actions. You know, when you, um, when you post something and then you pull it back, and then you, your explanation of why you pull it back um, doesn't pass the sniff test of a four-year-old child, um, then, then you, you, no one's going to trust you. Um, if the messenger is someone you don't trust, no one's going to trust you. So the science is there. We know how to do this. And so, frankly, we need people in those jobs um, um, that are, that are communicating to us that we trust. And it's gonna take some work um, to do, not just at the federal level, but also at the local level. We have had some governors, um, regardless of the party, who've done this very, very well. You know, Mike DeWine in Ohio, um, Governor Cuomo in New York, who have communicated very, very effectively. And we've had other governors, and I will just won't call them out, but you know who I'm talking about, um, who haven't done very well. Done a lot of work. Our next question kind of segues off of that from Christine Rose at Michigan State University. What is your recommendation for helping or educating the public so they increase their confidence in getting the vaccine once it's available? There's a survey on the news this week that said there was an increase in people saying they won't get the vaccine, which is pretty scary. Yeah, that was a Pew, a Pew Research study which showed that it went from like 70% of people said they would get it to only half of the people saying they're going to get, they would take the vaccine. Um, now, I understand that that we're in a, you know, we're in a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week news cycle, and lots of people saying things, and and all the misinformation going around, and we don't have a vaccine yet. All of this is supposition. So I think that first of all, once we get a vaccine, and we know it's safe and effective, and hopefully, the administration either this one or the next one gets their act together about how to communicate this effectively with an effective plan that will have a higher uptake. Um, we do know that the communities of color, particularly the African-American communities in particular, very, very distrustful of vaccines um, or any, any other medical people for that matter. We've all had to deal with that. Um, yeah, yeah, we talk about Tuskegee, the Tuskegee study. This is not just about Tuskegee. This is about the disrespect that happens each and every day when people go into healthcare systems. Um, you know, um, Tuskegee is, is, is uh, something that people talk about, but when you've been disrespected and you've been um, looked past and you've been lied to and you've been treated second, like a second-class citizen um, within the health system, 
um, on a repeated on a repeated basis, you know, you don't have a lot of trust. Um, where can we start? Well, obviously, people do have some trust with their healthcare providers. So, to the extent that um, we can convince their healthcare providers through the evidence that this vaccine is safe and effective, that's one way. The nurses convincing healthcare providers, nurses, physicians, um, pharmacists, people that are going to be giving this vaccine to people, um, they've got to they've got to have the trust. I think, in addition to us building broader trust in the public, got a lot of work ahead of us. We do. Mark Volk at, from Galen College asks, we constantly are updated regarding vaccine development, but not much news regarding therapeutics. Any updates? Yeah, um, there's not a lot of there's not, not information on the therapeutics. So you're right, vaccines are the, are, are, are the hot issue right now. Um, you know, um, I think the hottest issue on the table right now is um, some of the antibody therapies that are there that may seem to have some efficacy in reducing um, both um, um, the, de the degree in which people get sick from this disease. Um, I'm not aware that if there's any prevention studies going on, but there very well may be. And I, if there are, I'm not aware of the outcomes. But the antibody studies are the newest thing. And then of course, the um, antibody rich plasma, um, again, does show some efficacy, but again, they're doing it in very sick people. And, um, and of course, there's limited supplies of that. So um, that remains to be seen um, how effective that is. And by the way, when they put in place the emergency youth authorization, it, it had a, it, to some degree, interfered with some of the research studies because you really want really to get all those folks that you can into a research study. Um, so that we can actually, you know, compare apples to apples. And that does not happen as effectively with, it, with e emergency use authorization. Thank you. I'm going to combine the next two questions from Kristen Boyer and Audrey Tulane. They ask, what are the most updated recommendations for COVID positive asymptomatic individuals in regards to spreading the virus? and how long after the infection and possibly being able to transmit um, COVID after they test positive? Yeah, everybody should, everybody should think about uh, seven to 10 days. Seven to 10 days is a magic time period for a lot of things. You, you know, you, you, um, if you're exposed, you start, uh, um, if you're gonna be symptomatic, you may start getting symptomatic and within the first um, you know, three to five days, um, you're infectious for another, you know, um, five or six days or so. Um, so, you know, when people kind of look at those two buckets of seven days, seven to 10 days to 14 days, um, I think that's, that's the 14 day window is still, the, is still the, the, the big window that we should think about. And seven to 10 days for somebody who um, was exposed to somebody and, um, you know, gets tested, recognize that, you, you know, if you got exposed last night, don't get tested tomorrow wait a day or two before you get tested. Some good advice, again, with all of our students back. Carrie Simpson from Chamberlain University asks, we see such a focus on politics driving the processes and actions for this pandemic to the point we see healthcare teams taking sides. How can we in healthcare as a whole have the best understanding to support best practices that promote best outcomes for our communities? Follow the science and focus on our patients first. If we follow the science and put the patients in the center of everything we do, we'll be okay. Makes sense. Diane McAdams Jones asks, I work with the police department here in Orem on social justice issues. I am a nurse. The law enforcement officers really do not want to tackle ticketing and imposing fines on non-compliant mask wearers. I think that's my question. That was more of a statement. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know. That, that is true. I understand that. I don't know why anyone would give that to the police department anyway. I, I, I think that, you know, what you ought to do is give people a notice saying, put your mask on, <laughs> you know, and pass those around. Put them on flyers on cars, put them on windows, give us stickers, say wear a mask. And again, let's see what we can do to, to do that. Now, I know that there are, there are folks that feel pretty, pretty strongly about the regulatory approach. 
Um, and, you know, police departments are the people that tend to do that. Um, but I'm not sure we want to have people that carry guns do that. Yeah. Thank you. Our next question from Elizabeth. What are you hearing about budesonide nebulizer treatment for COVID? And please speak to the influenza virus and the possible emergence of a new influenza strain for this fall and winter. So I don't know about the nebulization issue, um, but let me take on the, the influenza issue. Um, so as you know, every March, the CDC and FDA get together and look at the strains that occurred in the Southern Hemisphere. That's our best prediction or predictor about what we're going to see um, this fall. Um, and they've done that. And that, and then they, you know, they, they go find the chickens and then they go find the eggs. Remind you that that's how we make flu vaccines still. And, um, <laughs> and then, because it takes a while and, uh, um, and then the, the companies produce it and they announced about a month or so ago that it was approved by the FDA and, 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 Shots were available. In fact, I got my shot about a month ago. Um, the experience in the Southern Hemisphere has been a relatively mild, in fact, in some places, a very mild flu season. Now, I don't want anybody to go out and say, oh, they had a, flu se a mild flu season, so we don't need to do anything here. There's a reason they had a mild flu season, most likely. Number one, guess what? Just like we were, they were in their houses. How do you get influenza? You get it from other people. In fact, um, you know, we always joke about the fact that the kids um, get it right before Christmas. Um, in school, they share their germs, they get their influenza and their flu viruses, and then they go home for Christmas and bring it, bring home to, to grandma. Um, the, also, they're masking, they're washing their hands, and they're physically distancing. What are the what are the what are the, what are the what are the non pharmacological tools to reduce the inf inf incidence of influenza? Wearing a mask, washing your hands, physically distance. So it has a co benefit, and um, but in addition, it's a vac we have a vaccine for influenza. We also have antiviral agents for influenza, and we have really good diagnostic quick tests for influenza. So I think we need to focus like a laser on making sure everybody gets their shots. Continuing with the masking, hand washing, and physical distancing, um, because since both diseases present with an influenza-like disease, you know, fever, muscle aches, um, not feeling well, cough, um, we can't rely on the loss of taste and smell, um, which does occur with um, with uh, COVID. Um, because as you know, a lot of people get a change in taste with even influenza, or when it, when they get a common cold. So um, it's, it, we're going to have, it's going to be about really not influenza first. And to the extent we can, you've had your shot, and we know that theoretically, in most cases, you'll be protected because you've had your influenza shot. Um, we can do an influenza screen on everybody that, that comes in with influenza like illness and definitively rule out influenza, you know, shot plus screen. Um, and then, then the question is, what do they have? And we can also do a COVID test on them. But that's going to be very important in the clinical setting because as someone asked a question about CPR earlier or other sick patients, we need to know whether it's influenza or COVID. And that's going to be hard through just um, um, our clinical, um, using our clinical judgment. Okay. Our next question from Elizabeth Merwin. What do you see as the biggest opportunities for learning from the challenges of the current pandemic to strengthen the public health infrastructure in the future? And what are the implications for changes in nursing and other health professional education programs? Well, public health isn't invisible anymore. Um, everyone knows that we need to invest time, money, and effort into rebuilding that system. Um, the question is, will they do it? And we're going to continue to push for them to do it. I think the other thing we've learned is that everybody in, in, in the world's second job is public health, right? Um, if you're a sanitarian, you know, getting rid of the trash, um, you know, we, we've been able to art articulate essential workers as public health workers in a variety of settings. So now that we've got everybody's attention, um, we need to begin getting them to try to think more like public health people. 
So I think as um, all of the disciplines, including nursing, need to begin thinking on ways in which we can build stronger population health skills in all of our trainees. Um, getting, you know, teaching people more about upstream issues. Um, understanding um, the, the importance of these public health systems. And, um, you know, in terms of, the, of, of addressing these, these outbreaks. Quite frankly, the failure of early testing and contact tracing and, and containing the disease early resulted in the overflow in our healthcare side of the house. So we have to invest in the public health side of the house. Otherwise, we're going to continue to have this happen. But by the way, while this was a very, very bad outbreak, I'm going to tell you about all the near misses we had, right? Mirrors, Zika, SARS-1. Um, you know, anyone yeah. has seen the map of all the bad bugs out there that are evolving each and every day? And the fact that this particular virus, like most RNA viruses, is mutating millions and millions of times every day. So it's, 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 it's mutating as we speak. And it can go in a lot of ways. It can become less infectious or more infectious, more lethal or less lethal. Um, so we, we've really got to understand this and, and preparing our workforces of the future because just like climate change and fires and, and storms, everyone says this is a hundred year pandemic. I'm going to predict right here and now that we don't, we're not going to have to wait the next 100 years before the next one. I hope I'm not around. <laughs> the next question from Odette is going to, it really builds off of your viral mutations. And, and she asks, is how is that going to impact the development and use of vaccines? Yeah, well, that's one of the things we're learning. So everyone's all excited about having vaccines and understanding we're doing the vaccine for the bug we have today. Um, and, um, you know, we know that the predominant strain has already shifted, although it's the strain that everybody's got pretty much around the world right now, they call it the G strain. Um, and it is, is um, has changed. So far, it does not seem that any of the changes have resulted in um, different efficacy of the vaccines that people have been, been working to use. Um, but that is a concern and we don't know. Um, so let's assume we get a vaccine that is at least 50% 50 50 effective. But if it means that half the people that get it um, will get a, a good immune response that's protective. Um, you know, then the question is, how does that, real how does that really work out in the real world? Um, and we don't know that until we see not just the safety and efficacy studies, but, you know, uh, remind you that once you've been injected, and at least several of these vaccines require two injections, then you have to put them out in the real world and see if they get infected. And so that's why the science will take some time. That's why all these arguments say, yeah, 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 we, we, you know, we got safety and efficacy data. Well, that's only one part of the study. The other part of the study is, is it really protective out there in the real world? And that, that unless, unless you're going to do um, exposure studies, people have talked about doing that, where you take people in a room and expose them to the virus, um, you, you're not going to know. Thank you. We have time for one last question. This is from Sarah um, Williams. She said that she had read an article hosted by Med Medscape where one study showed that patients who are on long-term statin treatment are more likely to survive COVID-19 than others who are not. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I saw that and I don't, I didn't read the whole study. Um, you know, um, this, this virus, again, the spiky thing, the spiky things that is, is the clue to all this, everything with this virus. That's, that is the place, that is the, the um, tentacle that she uses to attach to cells. Um, and it does uh, attach itself to very specific receptors uh, in our bodies. Um, as I understand it, the statins alter um, the receptivity of those receptors to the virus, um, at least um, theoretically. So I believe that's part of the mechanism of action. And again, as I understand it, um, um, it, it, there, there may be some role 
there, but I don't think that, I'm sure someone's studying it, but I haven't seen um, you know, it yet being promoted in any way um, as a therapeutic option, um, as much as it's, it's really a um, observation. Thank you so much, everyone, for your questions. And Dr. Benjamin, we totally appreciate your presentation and engagement with our colleagues and for sharing your wisdom with us. Um, I'm sure we'll take a lot of this information back to our um, home places and our organizations and enlighten our peers and work on strategies to improve the future. So please, everyone, can we give Dr. Benjamin another round of applause and thank him? Thank you, everyone. I enjoyed being thank here. You so much. Everyone, have a good day and be safe. Put your mask on and wear your mask, wash your hands, and be physically distanced. And I even have mine. I have an APHA. <laughs> oh, yes. I love it. <laughs> have a good day. Thanks. You too. Stay Bye -bye. safe.